All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, for everybody that wasn't here or hasn't uh, attended our previous training events, I'm Nick Finberg. I'm on Authenticate Special Services team. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, prior to joining Authenticate uh, almost two years ago, uh, I started off my career as a National Guard intelligence analyst, and then uh, that eventually landed me a job uh, working counter-narcotics um, for a uh, narcotics task force in the Chicagoland area. Uh, you know, coming from a smaller, lower budget task force, you know, I had to rely very heavily on OSINT techniques. Um, so that's, you know, you know, some of the stuff I'll be talking about today. Today we're going to be covering uh, dark web and then cryptocurrency will follow the dark web class um, since those are kind of synonymous. All right, so we're going to start with dark web. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the dark web was actually developed by U.S. military researchers uh, in the mid 1990s as kind of a method for uh, you know spies to communicate anonymously, and they actually opened it up to the public in 2004 to mix in all that traffic. Um, you know, so so their spies weren't you know sticking out like a sore thumb. So they mixed all this traffic in, you know, by opening the dark web to the public in 2004. And that's when it kind of became a hot spot for criminal activity. So today we're going to talk about, you know, the main, the main differences between, you know, the open, deep and dark web. We're going to show, you know, how Tor functions, the security benefits of Tor, and also the faults that come with using Tor, the security, you know, faults that come in there. And, you know, we're going to cover, you know, our technology and, you know, why you should use this to access the dark web. And then we're going to show some dark web investigation examples, um, how to identify new sites of interest. Um, because I know, you know, that can be a, one of the biggest hurdles of using dark web. So I'm going to show you some techniques for finding some of these sites that you want to access. And then I'm going to go into stuff like, uh, you know, how to combine dark web intelligence with open source intelligence. Um, and I'm actually going to show a live investigation that I ran through the other day. Um, so you guys can see, you know, these techniques in action. And then we'll finish it up with uh, a little Q&A section. So understanding the differences between the open, deep, and dark web is really important. So a lot of people get the deep and dark web mixed up. When, you know, if you look at this image here, the open web is, is the stuff like you do every day, right? Checking your Yahoo, checking Google, popular news sites, you know, the stuff that you're going to be doing every day that every, you know, every civilian is doing just about every day. That's regular open internet. Now, where it usually gets mixed up is the deep and dark web. So a lot of people get, you know, think those two are the same, but the deep, deep web is actually kind of like a... Uh, you know, academic papers, um, you know, law enforcement, um, you know, law enforcement databases, you know, cell phone databases, social media databases. That, that's the stuff that's more deep web. And then when you get into the dark web is where you're accessing it through a special platform and accessing it, you know, through the under router, you know, political pro. This is where you're going to find stuff like political protest forums, drug trafficking, you know, other illegal activities. So these, there is a very you know distinct difference between the deep web and dark web, right? Deep web can be accessed by most people. The dark web, you know, can be accessed by everybody, but you have to use special technology to access this stuff. So here's how it works. Again, so it was started as a U.S. Navy program in the 1990s. So what's happening is when you log into the dark web, right, you're bouncing from circuit to circuit to circuit. So the circuit is extended one hop at a time, and each circuit has a specific, um, a specific set of tools that they use to launch you into that next surf, um, into that next circuit. So and then finally, what happens is that last circuit, that last server you go to, is what delivers that website back to your computer, and delivers that web code to you. So this just kind of reiterates on that. So, you know, when you first log into the dark web, right, you've got your entry point to the Tor network, and that's that first node. So you see we've got different nodes for different purposes. Then you're going to go into that middle relay, which is going to give you those routing points between the entries and the guards, and these are secret relays that are going to bounce you between these different points of presence, right? So this is where that anonymity comes in, right? You're bouncing around all these different points of presence, so it's really hard to track which, you know, wh where your actual location is. And then finally, after that middle relay that launches you into these sites, you're going to get that exit relay. And these are the relays that actually route that traffic back to the end service. So that actual dot onion IP or you know, dot onion website that you're going to is what's launching you 
you know, you know, launching that site to you, that exit relay is how you're going to get that information. So this is where that security comes in, right? So Tor gives you know this anonymous aspect to all of the sites and users that are using their services. So there, you know, the if anybody that has experience with you know dark web research knows that these URLs are constantly changing, they're constantly updated, new sites are popping up and being taken down. So that's it's constantly changing, which gives the users and the administrators of those websites a very vetted security, right? So it's it, it can be very hard to track these people down because they're using very random websites and they're using very random points of presence when accessing these sites and services. So they're only decrypted through a public key that looks up values amongst a distributed hash table, right? So in order to get that information back to your computer, it goes through an encrypt, you know, encrypted key to get you to give you that information and that's extra security stack. So yeah, so the users have multiple, you know, multiple layered encryption. It makes it, you know, they're extremely secure when using this. That's why it became so popular among criminals. And, you know, it's, it's, it's starting to really, um, I mean, it, it's already extremely, you know, popular, but the more it goes on, the more popular it becomes. So, yeah, so, you know, identifying ways to technically compromise these websites and services is where it gets really tricky, right? These investigations often take years and years of time to, you know, to finally bring down these major marketplaces. I know um, recently, you know, as recent as last year, Dream Market was the main marketplace. Um, I would say it was the largest and most popular marketplace on the dark web where you could find literally anything you wanted, drugs, guns, money, you know, hacking services, anything could be bought on Dream Market. And it took multiple years for them to finally identify who the administrators were and to finally take them down. But what happens then is, you know, once one person takes it down, then it's our, you know, it, a few weeks later, it can already be relaunched. Right. So there are a lot of different techniques that go into finding this information. So what you'll see here, I have a, a you know, a real investigation example. You'll see some of the ways that you can combine this information with open source intelligence to find the person behind the username or behind the site and service. So I just quickly want to hit on um, you know, Silo Research Toolbox Dark Web. So this is our platform for accessing the dark web. Uh, by accessing the dark web using our platform, you have 100% cloud-based security. So, you know, when you're accessing the dark web in the typical Onion router, um, you know, oftentimes adversaries and criminals employ uh, employ you know sophisticated counter surveillance tools. They booby trap their sites with malware. You know, accessing the Tor network through the Onion router without using any you know different security can can be you know kind of a headache for cybersecurity experts right you can really infect your computer with malware um the, the site you know the people who run these sites are actually very sophisticated right so they're they're going to use the same measures that you know regular cybersecurity you know, uh, people use so that's why we created silo research toolbox dark web so with this you know you're you're accessing it through a cloud-based platform through you know other points of presence you know, you can quarantine this dark web malware where it's running 100% in the cloud and it's not actually touching your infrastructure. You know, you can monitor all your employees' dark web traffic by, you know, through secure admin um, admin capabilities. And, you know, you can enable research collaboration by using our cloud-based uh, shared storage where if, you know, in my experience, the bigger the case, the more people are involved. So it can be a headache to share this stuff. So we have built-in cloud storage where anybody that's in your work group can see anything that's that's saved within the cloud storage. And you guys will see this in action um, during the investigation portion. All right, so a lot of people, you know, when they hear about dark web investigations, right, they think it's this big undertaking, this big thing that's gonna be a multiple year investigation. And oftentimes that can be true. But in reality, you know, people all over the world are accessing the dark web. And this can be even people that are just in small town areas, right? It's not just it's not just these you know major criminal enterprises that are using the dark web. All of these cases start off by busting one person that's buying stuff off the dark web, and then you know, you just work your way up the chain of command, right? So, you know, the first example here, this Brockton man, you know, is using that dark web to access child porn, right? This was actually a massive investigation. I believe about 338 people worldwide were uh, were arrested. And 
and, and a lot of them were from these small towns. And, you know, I know one of them was from Alabama. We've got this one guy in Massachusetts. So these cases all start somewhere, right? You don't have to start off with the big guy, the guy that's run, you know, the administrator for this website. You, you know, a lot of times with these dark web cases, the reason they can take so long is because you're starting yourself at the bottom in some cases and working your way up, right? As a lot of investigations do. And then the second investigation here, you know, criminal ring used dark web marketplaces to sell drugs and turn Bitcoins into cash. So we'll be covering, uh, you know, cryptocurrency after our dark web portion, but you'll see that, you know, these two are synonymous. Cryptocurrency and dark web are synonymous, right? You're, these, you know, you have to use Bitcoin or you know, other cryptocurrency methods to buy stuff on the dark web. And then a lot of times this money is, you know, cryptocurrencies are used to launder this money that, you know, you've gotten from these uh, illicit gains, right? So this is one of those examples where this investigation took a very long time. It was a very, you know, collaborative effort between multiple agencies around the world. You know, it wasn't just taking place in the U.S., right, as many of these dark web cases, you know, happen to take place. Um, so another one, they just started off at the bottom and worked their way all the way up, which is what you're going to see a lot in these dark web investigations. All right, so these are some good places to start when looking and finding sites and services of interest. So a lot of people don't know this, but the, the best method for finding these sites, um, the best free method for finding these sites is just using the open web. So I've listed some sites here that I've used uh, in the past when looking for dark web marketplaces, looking for forums, looking for you know any, any type of dark web service that you're looking for. A lot of this information can be found on the open web. So we've got you know darkweblist.com where you know this is a site that's constantly updated with new sites and services and their new URLs. Uh, same thing with Reddit. Uh, as well as uh, deepwebsitelinks.com. Reddit's actually a really good one because it's, you know, with it being a forum type format, you know, anybody can go in there and post about different sites and services. So it's a great place to, to start when looking for people that are, you know, talking about dark web activity. So once you actually get onto the dark web, uh, my personal favorite site to start off with when actually, you know, starting from scratch, looking for a new site and service actually on the dark web is the dark web's version of Wiki. Uh, it's called the hidden wiki and I've included the URL there. So this is essentially, it's the dark webs version of Wikipedia, right? This is a great place that will have every different site and service you're looking for. It'll have, um, you know, have it's, it's very broken down in a nice format, you know, based on hacking services, drugs, guns, you know, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're looking for, you know, to investigate can be, you know, there's a section for it on the dark webs wiki. So that's a great place to start. And then there are some paid services out there as well. Recorded Future, Flashpoint, there, there are others out there. These are paid services that will cue you to dot onion sites of interest. So there's a lot of really great tools out there. So something to keep in mind when accessing these sensitive sites and services, you may need to generate a cover or a persona. Um, a lot of them don't just let anybody access their site, especially when you get to the level of purchasing, you need to create an account, right? So in this situation, obviously, um, you know, you have to consult with your internal policies to make sure you're not breaking any laws or breaking any, uh, you know, any rules within your organization. Just keep that in mind that in order to get access to these sites, you might have to create a persona for some of them. In our, you know, in our investigation example, you'll see that there are sites out there where you don't have to create a persona. Um, you can just access them without, you know, having to do that. All right, so this is where that extra data can come in, in handy, right? So once you find some information on the dark web, one of the best practices to do is to then copy and start doing some searches within the open web to see what pops up. So, you know, because of the secure nature, it can be difficult to find ident this identifying information, right? And that's the goal. We want to identify these persons of interest and find as much personally identifying information on them as possible. And one of the best methods is by combining this data with other data sources, such as open source intelligence. So when investigating these sites, right, there's a lot of identifying information that they can give you when starting off, right? So usernames and avatars, as we all know, humans are creatures of habit. I mean, even I can admit to this, right? There's some sites that I use that have the same username as other sites. So a lot of people are, 
not the brightest people on the dark web. And they're going to use the same usernames that they use on the dark web that they are using on other sites and services on the open web. So that just makes it easier for us, right, when, when looking for them. A lot of times on these forums, when they're selling a site or service or they're talking about something and they want people to reply, they'll put contact information. And a lot of times this will include stuff like a kick account, um, a telegram account, sometimes a phone number. I mean, even an email address, you know, you'll see in our investigation example, we were able, you know, I was able to identify a Gmail address, which all this stuff can be identified through, you know, um, through subpoenas or, or court records. Right. So. You have to take this information and copy it over into the open web to help, you know, it's just going to, the more data sources you use, the easier it's going to be to find information on these people. All right, just gonna, we're going to hop into the video next. Just give me a second to uh, pull up the video here. So give me a second here, just pull up the video. All right, so I started off on this forum, which is kind of a uh, it's kind of a ripoff of 4chan. You'll see a lot of these on the dark web, and there's a particular post that I found that that you know really interested me. It was an, an individual you know claiming to have access to a lot of different uh, pharmaceuticals, you know stuff around you know oxy, um, Adderall. I mean, pretty much any you know illegal pharmaceutical you can think of. This guy is claiming to have here. So as we can see in the video, we've got stuff. You know, this post was from April 14, 2020, at around you know 10:30 at night. And we've got stuff like, you know, Xanax, Oxycontin, Codeine, you know, Oxycodine. So he's selling a lot of different narcotics on the dark web. And he gave us some really good contact information. We've got stuff like a phone number, which is a WhatsApp number, a Wicker um, username, as well as a Telegram username. So the next thing I did was I went to reply so I could see the entire post because I wanted to see, you know, everything that he's advertising. If there's any additional um, you know, publicly identifying or contact information that he's put on here. But as you can see, he's, according to this website, he, you know, this guy has a lot of different stuff for sale, a lot of different stuff that's usually, you know, has to be accessed through pharmacy, but, you know, he claims to have access through it uh, in selling it on the dark web. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hop into the open web. You know, once I collect this information, I'm going to use Toolbox West Coast um, to appear that I am coming out of the West Coast of America. And I mean, I'm going to switch my user agent string to uh, Chrome on a Windows 10 because Chrome is by far the most popular browser around the world. So this allows me to blend in as a local of that environment. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Google search for the phone number with hard quotes around the phone number. What this allows me to do is it's only going to show websites where that phone number, like that exact phone number appears. So I'm not going to get, you know, a mix of different numbers. I'm not going to get a partial here. By putting quotations around my search, it's going to show me exactly where that phone number has appeared on other sites. 
So as you can see, we were able to identify an open web website that has a matching phone number in it. So this worldglobalpharmacy.com, which we're going to go ahead and head to right now, uh, has a matching phone number with that WhatsApp. So now, as you can see, by combining that information that we found on the dark web with OSINT, it has led us to an open source website advertising the exact same stuff. So you can see stuff like Oxy, DMT. I mean, this guy's even claiming to be selling, um, you know, venom for, uh, for poisoning people. And this is all on the open web. So, I mean... If he's advertising on the dark web, you know, he's uh, apparently trying to sell this stuff on the open web as well. So I'm going to try and go to their contact page. And what you'll see here is there's a problem with their contact page. So I'm going to use a little, no, uh, you know, a little unknown uh, tool here known as Google Cache. So by selecting the arrow that's just to the right of, uh, you know, the title on Google, I can view the cached version of this website. So as you can see, um, you know, so Google will take screenshots of every website. So this is a snapshot of the website as it appeared on February 27th of 2020. But this one is actually working, right? So as you can see, where we tried to access the current version, it, it no longer works. There's something wrong with the database. But we were able to identify an address in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, there's our matching phone number, you know, from the WhatsApp post. And there's another email address that we can use to collect this information on this suspect. And then if I scroll down, uh, you'll see a little you know, message area. And then there's the matching address, matching phone number, and matching email address again. So obviously, whoever this uh, person is that's selling this information, uh, they're not very good about hiding it. So the next thing I'm going to do is hop into Whois Records and search to see who registered that domain. So simply just go to whois.domaintools. There's a lot of different Whois tools out there. Uh, this is just the one that I use the most. And then you just paste that URL into that page. So as we can see here, the you know the person who registered this, they used um, a, a third-party registration group uh, known as Name Silo LLC. No relation to Silo by Authenticate. That's just a weird coincidence. Uh, so we've got the URL. It was registered by Name Silo LLC. Uh, the website's about 207 days old. I went to the actual, you know, name silo website and they are, um, they do say they're very compliant with, you know, with state, local, federal law enforcement. So, you know, they have to give this information up on who registered this information. So at this point in my investigation, what I would do is take this information um, and reach out to namesilo.com, right? And whether it be through court order, through a subpoena, or, you know, just reaching out and talking to the person, you know, on the phone and, and seeing what kind of records they have on these individuals. We've got stuff like IP address, IP locations. These can be grouped together based on who registered it. So because this is a group that registers domains for other people, uh, there's a lot of information that can be you know, uh, found here. So you see the Whois records are very updated. April 22nd, they were updated. You know, the domain name matches what we're looking for, worldglobalpharmacy.com. And it, you know, this section of the page will actually include the contact information for reaching out to who registered you know, that uh, that website. So it was registered by Name Silo, a company, you know, a third party company that registers, IP, you know, registers websites for people. But they have to comply with law enforcement. Right. So this is a, a good step here to finding out who actually registered this information. The resellers offshore domains, which you know, kind of kind of fits the fits the narrative here. Uh, you know, we've got a registered street address for that organization. So tons of information can be found on these Whois records. You know, if, if it was actually registered by, you know, an individual and not a third party company, uh, you know, we would have that information. But unfortunately, this particular website, they were smarter about it and used a third party company to register this website. So I'm going to go back to my search results here for searching on the phone number. And I'm just going to, you know, kind of go through these different results and see what I can have or see what I can find. So on this second page is where I found another forum post 
uh, with another individual talking about the exact same stuff. And this is just a great, you know, searching for stuff with hard quotations around it is a great way of finding, you know, additional information, verifying through other sources. So as we can see, we've got this VD truck forum here uh, and it, pretty much the exact same advertisement, right? You know, buy all these different, you know, pharmaceuticals. Here's our website. Here's our phone number. You know, we even, you know, they even say we seal in plastic bags and clean with a special liquid, you know, no smell or risk. Uh, you know, we've never had any issues with uh, custom deliveries, uh, you know, two to three days in Europe. Outside of Europe is three to five days. So the, all this information matches up, right? And, if, and what we're going to see here is there's actually additional contact information that we can find here. So now we've got a new email address. Again, the matching phone number, which we've seen across all these different websites. We have a new telegram and then there's the website again. So again, just, just keep going through all these different searches and it allows you to just keep collecting this information and it's gonna help you because you're getting more and more personally identifying information. That's just gonna give you, you know, more opportunity to find out who this person is. So I wanna do a search for the website, um, specifically around their payment and delivery. Uh, with hard quotations. So again, it's only going to show anything that has that exact URL within the page. So I found something very interesting on the third page, actually. And it was a forum post on this Motion magazine. It was actually a comment on a blog. So I, I looked at this individual, um, you know, found this page. You know, somebody commented on something about a three-bedroom farmhouse. And if you go down to World Global Pharmacy, you can see this post. And this post is really interesting. So we've got this guy, uh, Sanuke Roy, and he put this whole write-up about basically how to buy narcotics on the open web, which happened to include the contact information for our World Global Pharmacy. So you've got, let me look at the list of all these different drug marketplaces this guy put on here. And these are all open web websites. So obviously, whoever this guy is, he knows a lot about buying uh, pharmaceuticals online without going through a pharmacy. And we've got, I think, you know, six different groups of websites, and then we get to World Global Pharmacy, right? And it's gonna have pretty much the entire, you know, international discounted pharmacy meds, uh, you know, dedicated to giving you convenient access, you know, all the different, you know, narcotics they sell and every single different URL they have, you know, all matching up with our, uh, you know, with our original search. And he's even got stuff for Easy Pass Documents, Kingston Flavors, DarkWallStreets.com. So whoever this guy is, he obviously knows a lot of information about buying, you know, illegal anything on the dark, you know, on, on the open web. And, you know, it looked like he had some dark web stuff included. So we created the profile about five months ago, basically created the profile, you know, and made that one post. I wasn't able to find any additional posts on this individual, but, you know, by looking, you know, by just doing this quick 10 minute investigation, right, we were able to identify a lot of different data sources. All right, so here's just a little overview of the investigation that I created. So as you can see here, so the steps taken, you know, we, we found that forum post and which led us to the WhatsApp number, the Wicker username, and then the Telegram usernames, right? So all three of those things came from the forum post. And then by doing a Google search for, you know, hard quotations around that phone number, this is what led us to that website and that email address. So we've got worldglobalpharmacy at gmail.com. And then, you know, we tried going to the contact page, which ended up leading to, you know, the, the contact page was broken. And then by using Google Cache, we were able to view the last, you know, working version of that contact page, which led us to the address of 1819 Ashcraft Court, Beaumont, Texas. You know, we got another email address of info at worldglobalpharmacy.com. So we've got a lot, you know, we're, we're, we're building up that profile right on who this person could be. So... After running the WHOIS records, we can see that it was registered by name Silent LLC. 
you know, on, on September 20th of 2019, it is still an active website. Um, so at that point, you know, what we could do is take, you know, reach out to Namesell LLC to see what kind of information we could get on who, you know, actually is behind registering that website. Then we were able to find that VD truck form, which led us to additional identifying information. We got the Proton email um, and then another telegram, which was that Dr. Hades. And then finally, you know, doing the Google search, looking for the payment and delivery uh, site, which ended up not working. Uh, it, it's, it appears that, you know, either, you know, this could be a scam and they just make their website look legit. And that's why some of these, you know, versions of their website are not working. Um, but, that, you know, then by doing that search, it allowed us to find that blog comment by Sanuke Roy with all of that information about basically how to buy narcotics online, uh, you know, without having to go through a pharmacy. So, as you can see, by just, you know, doing this quick 10, 11 minute investigation, we got a lot of identifying information on this, you know, on our possible suspect. So, you know, we've got the WhatsApp number, the Wicker username, the Telegram usernames. You know, we've got a website with, the, you know, with the, you know, name information on who registered that website. Uh, you know, all of the email addresses, we've got a Gmail, a Proton mail, uh, you know, it's, you know, at globalpharmacy.com. And we've got a possible suspect, right? You know, at, at this point in my investi investigation, what I could do is input all this information, you know, start sending out subpoenas, court orders, um, and, and start uploading this information into some of these deep web databases, you know, stuff like TLO, Accurate, um, you know, uh, law enforcement databases to see if I can get any matches or anybody that could, you know, anybody that's, um, also could be working an investigation on this group. All right, so that concludes the dark web portion. We're going to hop into cryptocurrency next. Uh, we'll go ahead and... Uh, take a few minutes to uh, just look at some of the questions um, in the chat here. And then if there are no uh, further questions that need to be answered, um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next subject. So if there are any further questions that pop up, you know, while you're, uh, you know, while you're thinking about this, while, while you're digesting this information, you know, after the class, you can reach out to uh, OSINT at Authenticate.com if there's anything that pops up in your head as we're going through this. All right, let's go ahead and move on to cryptocurrency. All right. So since, you know, Bitcoin had this this massive boom in 2017, the amount of users participating in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, uh, you know, nearly doubled from 18 million to 35 million in just a two year period. So it, it's really important for us as investigators and analysts to stay updated on how, you know, on what cryptocurrencies are coming, excuse me, what cryptocurrencies are coming out. And, and you know, investigation methods for tracking these cryptocurrencies. Right. So we're just going to talk about. Uh, you know, the, the history of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, you know, how the how this stuff can be, you know, how cryptocurrencies can be bought and traded through exchanges. We're going to discuss crypto wallets, how to run, you know, forensics and tracking and tumbling services on these cryptocurrencies, um, as well as, uh, you know, money laundering with cryptocurrencies, you know, the, the spike in ransomware using cryptocurrencies. And then we'll finish it up with Q&A. All right. So for anybody that doesn't know, um, just a quick overview, you know, it, cryptocurrency is a peer to peer version of electronic cash, you know, that can be sent over through, you know, it's sent over through the Internet, you know, and, and it allows for these online payments without going directly through a financial institution. So 
obviously, you know, criminals hear that description and, you know, they think that they've hit the gold mine, right? That, that they're never going to be caught again. And, you know, that they you know, will primarily only use cryptocurrencies, right? So there's been a huge spike in money laundering using these cryptocurrencies, as well as, you know, purchasing illegal goods with cryptocurrencies. So here's just kind of a brief history of cryptocurrency, right? It, you know, it, it came out in 2008, you know, Bitcoin.org was registered, you know, by this individual. You know, all this stuff was released in 2008. You know, the first blockchain technology was created in 2009. And then by 2010, the first official transaction in Bitcoin, uh, you know, took place for two pizzas. And, you know, those pizzas would be worth uh, roughly $67 million today. So by 2011 and 2012, that's when Bitcoin started to catch on a little bit. It's slowly rising. It's starting to build up a reputation. You know, it's, it's starting to build up a reputation uh, with Bitcoin. And then, you know, in 2013, the Silk Road gets busted. Sounds like we're having some sound issues here. All right, so, so yeah, so Silk Road is busted and you know, there's been arrests that are made for money laundering at this point. So people are starting to, you know, the public is starting to catch on because, you know, the Silk Road was a massive dark web market, right? And when you hear something like that being taken down, that's when the public starts to hear about it, right? Obviously, there were a lot of news articles that came out. I mean, there were books written about the Silk Road. Uh, so that's when the public starts to catch on. So what was weird is that in 2014, the price started to fall. So, so there's a Mount, Mount Gox was created, which was a big Bitcoin exchange. There was a big hack that happened where millions of Bitcoin were stolen. Um, so that made the price fall in 2014. Then in 2016, it starts to rise up again. And then boom, in 2017, Bitcoin hits an all-time high of $19,783 per Bitcoin. So that's obviously a massive increase. I mean, that's when, I mean, unless you were living under a rock at that point, uh, you heard about this massive increase in Bitcoin, which obviously led to a mass rush in people purchasing Bitcoin and, you know, more Bitcoins being created. Or, I'm sorry, more cryptocurrencies being created. So with cryptocurrency comes blockchain technology. So blockchain, essentially what it is, it's an, an open decentralized ledger that records transactions between two parties. So whenever a Bitcoin happens, right, there's this blockchain that is created. So blockchain is the technology that runs Bitcoin. You know, blockchain existed before Bitcoin, but Bitcoin does not exist without blockchain. So you need this information. Now, keep in mind that Bitcoin is only one cryptocurrency, and now there's almost 2,000 in total, you know, worth about $369 billion in value. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin is obviously the most popular of all of these different, you know, of all these different cryptocurrencies. But, you know, there are some other ones that are starting to increase in popularity. So this is just a quick diagram of how blockchain works. So very easily, you know, A wants to send money to B, you know, the transaction is then represented online by this block. And then the block is broadcasted to every party in the network. So those in the network will approve the trans, you know, approve or disapprove the transaction. And the block can be added to the chain, which provides, you know, this information about what happened in this, you know, particular transaction and the money will move from A to B. So that's how this all works, right? Bitcoin needs that blockchain to, you know, to happen in between these transactions in order to make the transactions valid and operational. So there are a few different methods for purchasing Bitcoin. And by far the most popular is Coinbase. So Coinbase, you know, there's currently about 30 million Coinbase users, and there's been about 150 billion dollars traded through Coinbase. So this is by like by a long shot the most popular way of buying and trading Bitcoin. Uh, it, you know, it's very easy. You know, you can connect your bank account to these, uh, you know, to a Coinbase account, and this allows you to actually purchase cryptocurrencies. You know. 
um, you know, through this through this site and service, it's very easy to use. Anybody can use it. Um, you know, it, it is a regulated financial service company in the U.S., so you do have to have ID verification. So this is a great opportunity to identify suspects, right? So if you find someone that has a Coinbase account, or if you find a Coinbase account, um, you know, it is a regulated financial institution. So they're going to have great records on you know everybody that owns their you know owns a particular account. So what you're going to, you know, so there are, like I said, there are many different methods for purchasing, you know, cryptocurrencies, but a lot of them use wallets, right? So you have to keep this, keep these Bitcoins somewhere, right? You know, it's going to be on your computer. So there's stuff like online Bitcoin wallets that allow you to save your Bitcoins in a particular area. But there's a lot, you know, there are some out there that are, uh, you know, designed to make them private, right? Designed to help people blend in, you know, with, you know, without giving away their personal identifying information. So you've got stuff like dark wallets, right? Dark wallets was designed to make it completely private so that their information isn't going to leak out on whose wallet it belongs to, right? And there's, I mean, there's even paper wallets, you know, private keys that are printed out. Uh, there's actually a pretty funny story about, uh, it was recent, actually, I think it was uh, sometime in December that somebody, you know, left out all their Bitcoin codes and hid them, you know, in their apartment and their landlord had gone in and thrown away, I think it was something like $50 million in Bitcoin codes that this guy had not saved. So uh, so the paper wallets can be a little dangerous. Obviously, if you lose those private keys, uh, you're kind of screwed if you have $50 million um, in Bitcoin. But it turns out the guy was a massive drug dealer. So, uh, you know, not the smartest one, clearly, for, for printing out his Bitcoin codes and losing them. So Bitcoin's popularity amongst criminals is because they think it's anonymous, right? When in reality, it's actually pseudonymous. So your Bitcoin pseudonym is, pseudonym is the address in which you receive Bitcoin. So every transaction involving that address is stored forever in that blockchain, right? So if your address is ever linked to anything in your identity, every transaction can be linked back to that person. So this information can be collected if they give it to you, obviously the smarter people are going to be a lot better and they're going to use only anonymous Bitcoins, you know, that don't have these pseudonyms. I'm sorry. Well, cryptocurrencies, not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one in particular. Um, and there are, you know, there are some services out there that will help them hide this information. And that's, you know, comes with our, our next topic here, which is cryptocurrency tumblers. So cryptocurrency tumblers are, you know, allow these people to mix their, you know, potentially identifying currency with the untraceable Bitcoins that are out there. So these are very, obviously, this is very popular amongst criminals, and, you know, particularly around money laundering. I mean, pretty much this process alone of using a, a, a cryptocurrency tumbler is, you know, kind of definition, you know, money laundering, right? You're putting your you're identifying, you know, dirty money into these cryptocurrency tumblers and they're spitting out a much cleaner, you know, unidentifying version of your cryptocurrency, right? So, you know, these addresses, some of these addresses can be grouped by their ownership, but, you know, if they're using these anonymous Bitcoins, you have, that's where you have to start using these additional OSINT techniques, right? You have to, you know, once those, once that trail kind of disappears on these Bitcoin mixing services, you have to start to rely heavily on OSINT to see what other information you can find on a specific address. Again, so... So obviously, you know, with the big explosion of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, money laundering has has skyrocketed using these services, right? So, uh, you know, it's a lot more convenient for criminals to use Bitcoin because there are so many different services out there like those cryptocurrency tumblers that are going to mix your, you know, cryptocurrencies into non-identifying cryptocurrencies. And, you know, just the ability to, you know, conduct these rapid anonymous transactions makes it very, um, you know, appealing to criminals. So, you know, in 2019, there was something like, you know, $4.5 billion worth of Bitcoin that was, you know, used for fraud purposes. And as you can see, there's also a massive increase in 
cryptocurrencies being stolen. I mean, from, from 2018 to 2019, it went down a little bit, um, you know, and the increase in money laundering pretty much skyrocketed. But, you know, it's, there's a lot of people out there that actually steal Bitcoin and steal Bitcoin addresses as well. So you've got fraud across the board um, when it comes to cryptocurrencies. All right, so here's where the tracking and forensics come in, you know, comes in of these Bitcoins. So using these sites that I have listed here, you know, you've got blockexplorer.com, blockchain.info, and chainanalysis.com. If you have a specific Bitcoin address that you are interested in, it's very simple. If you upload this information into these tools, it'll give you any identifying information that is attached to that account, as well as any previous transactions that they've had with that account. So uh, you know, these are great open source tools that allow you to, you know, find any identifying information that may be attached to some of these Bitcoin. And it's very simple too. once, you know, once you have the address, you know, that's, that's kind of the hard part. You have to get the address first um, and then just simply, you know, copy and paste that address into these tool and any information that this tool, you know, that these tools have, you'll be able to see that information. All right, so this is this is uh, you know kind of hard to see, but it's just you know kind of a step by step guide on, on following the Bitcoin breadcrumbs, right? So you've got you've got your buyers and sellers, and you know the obviously the buyers have to give that Bitcoin information in that transaction to the seller, right? So usually the seller will give them uh, you know a Bitcoin address to send the money to. You know that's how the, these these massive marketplaces work is they'll give you an address to send you know your money. And how to, you know, when, when you are purchasing narcotics or illegal services on the dark web. And then, you know, all that information is represented in the blockchain, right? And that's where law enforcement can come in and start to look at those blockchain addresses and start inputting them into third party tools to hopefully identify any, ident you know, public personally identifying information on these suspects that are sending and receiving Bitcoin. So this is, you know, it, it, it can be a long process and that's why, you know, these massive dark web investigations can take so long because there is, you know, so much information that's out there. Obviously, the bigger the case, you know, the longer it's going to take, the more information you're going to have, the more you're going to need to run through these, you know, Bitcoin tracking services. But it, it's not impossible, right? Especially, you know, with uh, the, the criminals that are putting this information out there and connecting their actual identities to, you know, these Bitcoins. So here's a, a, an example of a transaction. So you know you've got you know the the Bitcoin address that the that the uh, you know Bitcoin came from here on the left uh, around the green circle, and then you know you've got the new change address. So whenever you send this transaction to someone, that Bitcoin is now going to have a new address because it's going to be implemented into that wallet. So you can see the amount that you know was paid for that particular service. So, you know, this information is tracked and this is that blockchain.info that's actually showing the transaction, any details that are collected with that transaction. And obviously, you know, the more identifying information that an individual puts into their, you know, Bitcoin address, the more information you're going to be able to pull out from it. And then finally, so the last thing you're going to see that's really popular amongst Bitcoin users is cyber you know cyber criminals using uh, ransomware using a bitcoin address so you know this is a type of you know software that will you know lock down all of your you know lock down your computer lock down all your files and oftentimes what we're seeing is there's a big increase in criminals actually using cryptocurrencies uh you know to to basically steal you know steal this information from people and to you know hold their information you know for ransom so there's you know been a massive increase you know pretty much followed the increase of bitcoin um, with cyber criminals using Bitcoin to, you know, receive payment for locking down these files. All right. Well, that's uh, that's everything I wanted to cover today for uh, for dark web and cryptocurrency. I really appreciate everybody for attending. Um, again, if you have any additional questions that pop up. Um, you know, while, you know, you're, you're, you're digesting this training, um, feel free to reach out, you know, to OSIN at authenticate.com. Um, and, and we'll be able to get to that, you know, answer that question for you as soon as possible.